Hello, everyone. This is News Now from the Belmont Journal, and we are having our regular weekly update with Joanna Juvelis of the Citizen Herald. And you can find the Citizen Herald on, online at belmont.wickedlocal.com. And I'm your host today, Mike Crowley. So, Joanna, it's good to see you. Good to see you too, Mike, as always. All right, so at Monday's select board meeting, State Senator Will Brownsberger and Rep Representative Dave Rogers discussed what the emerging federal American Rescue Plan dollars could look like for Belmont. How do things look, Joanna? Well, according to uh, State Senator Will Brownsberger, Belmont is likely to see $8.6 million from uh, that 1.9 trillion COVID stimulus package. Um, a million of that is just going to be for the schools. Okay. And now that money point... does come with strings attached, doesn't it? Yes. So um, first, first off, uh, what our state senator uh, stressed is that this is preliminary. It's subject to change, and he would, you know, um, they strongly advise against the town making plans based on this preliminary information. The U.S. Treasury will ultimately calculate the final payment amounts, so the town should not make plans about overrides based on these estimates. So that that's important to note. Okay. Um, but the other thing is there are four categories of how the federal funds must be used, and uh, the first is to respond to public health emergency and economic impact. You know, it can provide it can it can provide aid to small businesses and households, not just general government spending, but new spending. Uh, number two, it can provide premiums to eligible workers in the field who come in to respond to COVID. Uh, third, it's um, to, the, to the extent the town has lost revenue due to COVID, this money can be used to replace those revenue losses. And fourth, to, it, it can be used to make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband, broadband investment. Also worth noting, the million dollars that the schools will be getting, 20% of that has to go towards programs for loss of learning, such as summer school or extended day. So then there's another 800,000 that they can play with for uh, general school support. So there's, there's a lot of unknowns here, Mike, um, but also worth noting, Patrice Garvin, our town administrator and superintendent John Phelan said they did not budget for COVID expenses in the FY22 operating budget because they were anticipating federal aid. So it's important to know that. Um, so I, I think Patrice Garvin actually described the way they budgeted as, um, you know, they sort of calculate, they, they, they sort of put those kinds of expenses in a, a parking lot. Parking um, lot is the word that, you know, term, um, you know, for, you know for, anticipate, for anticipated potential federal aid. So it's, yes. It's not part of the, it's not formally part of the budget, but, but you know, we've certainly been racking up what those expenses might look like. And Tom Caputo, select board vice chair, and who was chair of the financial task force too, which determined, you know, which recommended the override question that's going on our April 6th ballot. He said um, the funds will not help with the structural deficit or the uh, operating expenses of the town. So, that's the information we have right now. I'm sure there will be more to come. I'm sure maybe the warrant committee and, me, and maybe the select board will want to educate people more about, about this because it's easy to come to the conclusion that this sounds like, okay, well, Belmont's getting this money. Maybe they don't need an override. Um, that's, that's what a lot of people may be thinking, but um, I, I, uh, I believe that that is not necessarily the case. Yeah, I, I think I think you know, based on what we know so far, most most of the money has to be spent for things that are that are that are restricted and not part of the general operating budget. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, time will time will tell. It's time. It's it's interesting the timing of it all too. Um, I think it'll be, I think you can see money as soon as 90, as soon as 90 days, but there's a certification process that the town has to go through. It's not necessarily an application process. They call it a certification process. 
Okay, so so um, there, there there is a lot of potential for ways in which the, the funds could help the community. Um, another thing, Joanna, that was discussed at the select board meeting, um, you know, there's been a, a great deal of work uh, done looking at potential siting options for new high school tennis courts. And, and so Joanna, my question to you is, where will they be placed? It's still not known, Mike. Uh, okay. I reported on this. Um, so the tennis community really would like to see tennis courts on the new Belmont Middle and High School campus for the varsity team. They're the only varsity team that doesn't have a place to play on the actual campus. And they want five tennis courts somewhere on the high school campus. So what's happening is the town school and building committee for the high school have hired an architect from Perkins and Will to design plans for the area west of Harris Field. That is the area where there are currently fields for junior varsity, baseball, softball, soccer, a throwing field, and also the existing Skip Viglarolo rink. This architect presented three potential options at Monday night select board meeting, showing the existing rink with an addition for like additional locker space and um, I think storage and, and other things that the current rink doesn't have, plus the fields that are needed for all the athletic programs at the high school. So there, that was one option. He showed an okay. option, oh, plus 90 parking spaces. That's, it's very important to mention that the approval that the high school project got from the planning board was for 90 parking spaces west of Harris Field for dedicated for student parking, as well as uh, day park, daytime parking and hockey rink parking. And th that's to prevent people from parking in the surrounding neighborhood. So that is one thing right now that this architect basically is designing his plans based on the need for 90 parking spaces. So all of his design options, the second design option was showing the rink in a different location further back. So you would tear down the existing rink and rebuild a new rink. And by the way, the new rinks that he's presenting are 80% larger than the existing rink because they're going to have these extra facilities that the current rink doesn't have. Still a okay. single sheet of ice, but additional lockers and storage. And um, they, they can even be converted, the, the rink could even be converted to tennis courts, indoor tennis courts in these options that he presented. But he said it's not for a high school varsity tennis program. It's only for recreational use. High school varsity tennis programs have to have outdoor tennis courts. So all of his options show that you can fit five tennis courts, but you would have to take away part of that 90 space parking requirement. A considerable amount of that 90 space parking requirement would be used up by these tennis courts. Okay. So the question of, and the high school building committee will be meeting this Friday to talk about it. Do they go back to the planning board and say, can we have, can, can you require us to have less parking space in this area so we can fit tennis courts? I don't know if they'll do that. Second, the school committee will probably be discussing it as well. Um, and for disclosure, Joanna, I'm on the school committee, um, but that's right. we've not discussed this yet. Right. So the next steps here are Perkins and Will will continue doing the work that they've been asked to do. They're going to now do, for these three options they presented, they're going to do a cost analysis to show what each of the options cost. Then these options will probably be presented again at another community forum because at Monday night select meeting, there was no time for public comment. So of course the, the town wants to get public comment and they'll have a community forum on this before any final decisions are made. So stay tuned for, for that. There will be a community forum. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Joanna, so Belmont has a new fire chief and he's been sworn in. Yes. Um, what can you tell us? I have to say on March 15th, early in the morning, 8 a.m., um, I learned that they were gonna be swearing in the new fire chief and they were supposed to be doing it outdoors in front of uh, town hall at the main entrance. However, it was so cold they decided last minute to move it indoors and it was it took place inside the town hall auditorium. So this was the first live in-person event 
inside a town building since the pandemic shut down. Okay. And I have to say it was really kind of emotional in a way um, to see people that you hadn't seen in a year, even the select board, the three select board members were excited to see each other. Like we haven't seen each other in person in, in a year. We haven't been in the same room. It's so it was really, I have to say it's touching in that way. Um, although speaking of touching, um, as you'll see from some video that I took, there was still air handshakes going on and social distancing and mask wearing. Um, so yeah, this COVID is still in our in our lives and still uh, still not completely back to normal. But it was nice to have an event in the town hall in person for this um, person who's coming from North Providence, Rhode Island, David De Stefano. He's a, our new fire chief, and you know I wish him well. His family was there. They're going to have to look for. Um, a place to live closer, closer to Belmont within a, uh, I think it's a 15 mile radius. He has to find something. Um, he's got six months to find something. And I spoke to him and his wife and, and uh, you know, they're focusing on some co different communities. Uh, it's just going to be the two of them. They don't need a big place. So we'll see what they end up uh, finding. Um, so he was sworn in by town clerk, Ellen O'Brien Cushman. Uh, he was surrounded by a, a group of firefighters from the department, as well as um, Wayne Haley, who served as acting chief and was also one of the final final candidates. There were three final candidates. Um, so he was there and he's now back to his role as assistant fire chief. Okay, Joanna. Well, uh, thanks so much. And we will talk with you next time with additional updates. You're welcome.